Okay, and uh, Susan, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, we're glad to have you here. We've been hoping to do something on feathers for a long time, so that's our chance today. Um, if I, I'm just going to go through my slides fairly quickly. If you have questions, put them in the general chat box, and I'll make sure that they get taken out and that they get answered at the end. And so the best way to keep in touch with us is by joining the C2CC announce list. It's just announcements, maybe two or three a month. Or you can like us on Facebook, or you can follow us on Twitter. And if you need help due to a disaster, this is a 24-hour um, National Heritage Responders line, and they'd be happy to help. We know that people have been suffering from a lot of fires and floods and hurricanes. Um, our, our discussion forum that used to be on the website has moved, and so you can go uh, to Connecting to Collections Care uh, at coll connectingtocollections.org and get instructions on how to move over to the new platform. But we'll still give you the same service, we'll still answer questions, and we'd be happy to have you. Uh, you can contact me anytime. This is my email address. Uh, coming up, we have, at uh, the end of this month, a free webinar on preserving artifacts of free speech, caring for political memorabilia. The beginning of next month, we have a webinar on closing a museum for good. And because that's a question that comes up, and we're also um, beginning our first course. And if you register by today, uh, or the end of today, you can get a discount um, still. Otherwise, you can register up until the day of the course. Um, and it's a course on preservation methods and materials for exhibitions, and it's being offered in conjunction with PACN. OK, so I'm going to turn this over to Ellen Perlstein, our first uh, presenter, and she'll be followed by Irene Torrens. So, Ellen, there you are. Thank you, Susan. Um, hello, everybody. I see some names here that are familiar, and I'm delighted. Um, uh, my name is Ellen Perlstein. I'm at the University of California, Los Angeles, and um, prior to that, I was a museum conservator for 25 years. So, um, it, you know, I'm not going to dwell on biography details, but um, I've been very involved with the documentation and caring for feather work um, uh, in recent years, so I'd like to share with you. Um, so <clears throat> feather work is represented in many of our collections in all different formats, right? Everything from taxidermy to study skins to contemporary sculpture. In the center, you see a slide of a sculpture by the artist Peta Coyne. And Peta Coyne had a period um, of working where she used taxidermy bird specimens um, in conjunction with other materials in creating these um, quite sizable, complex sculptures. And then, of course, in fashion and couture, so we have a lot of um, feathers used in, um, in you know, hats and, and dresses, et cetera, et cetera. And then also in regalia. So the image on the far right is from the California State Indian Museum. And it's an example of a display of um, native regalia from California. And that actually reminds me that um, we uh, started some poll questions for all of you. And the first poll is um, asking what kinds of featherwork are found in your collections um, between these different categories. So I really am looking forward to you know, hearing your responses. So when I consider the condition of featherwork, and I consider um, the, the different uh, exposures that feathers have had, I think about it in three different stages. I consider first life cycle wear and tear on feathers. Obviously, birds molt. They go through a molting phase, either annually or semi-annually. And so birds actually 
um, have feathers that are undergoing exposure to light and ultraviolet radiation. They're, um, they're preening their feathers. They're um, oiling their feathers. They're doing all kinds of things, but their feathers get pretty worn out after the, you know, right before the, the molt when they replace them. So there are features of feathers that are actually life cycle damage during the life of the bird. Then there is cultural wear of feathers. So, you know, typically feathers are um, used in lots of different formats that may be performed. So the middle image is Maidu and Miwok um, feathered regalia being performed um, up north of San Francisco um, at an event that I attended. And, you know, the feathers are maintained by these regalia makers, they're, you know, as I said, they're performed, they're preserved. There's a whole set of um, use wear, cultural use wear that occurs with feathers, and we have to be aware of that too. And then finally, there's the, there's the collection um, life cycle of feathers, right? So while feathers are in our collections, like in the image on the right, they also undergo exposure to light and ultraviolet and handling and travel and all kinds of um, all kinds of things. So I like to think about these three phases because we, you know, some things we um, we may mistakenly think have happened to feathers during their time in our collection, and perhaps that's not the case. Perhaps it preceded um, entering our collection. So one of the major things we have to think about when we're dealing with handling feather work is um, the fact that feathers have often been treated with toxic pesticides and that there may be residual pesticides present. And in fact, um, uh, I just see here, thank you for the posting my second, my second um, uh, uh, query, which is about um, uh, the numbers of feathered items in your collection. And then later on, I'll also be all asking about whether or not your feathers have been um, treated with toxic pesticides, whether you know that they, whether they've been treated with toxic pesticides. So, um, you know, this arsenic skull and crossbones may be familiar to some of you, but unfortunately in many cases there is no labeling to indicate that a pesticide of this toxicity has been used. So we have to make assumptions. We have to pretty much assume that just about every feather may have been treated in some way unless we know otherwise. The current slide I'm showing you has to do with Native American materials. So the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act which passed in 1990 was amended in 1996 and it it means that any federal agency any agency receiving US dollars um, any museum or library or archive or any repository receiving federal dollars has to document and present known treatments um, of regalia or you know sacred materials that with pesticides, preservatives, or other substances that could present a hazard to people who are going to be handling those materials. So obviously, um, awareness of uh, pesticide presence is, has been a very important topic for conservation and collections care of featherwork over the last, you know, 20 some odd years. So what is your um, immediate kind of uh, protection that you can afford yourself? And I would say immediately that that is always handling feather work with gloves, irrespective of whether or not you know that it's been treated, always handle it with gloves. Um, in this particular image, I would say that the wearer on the right who's wearing the blue nitrile glove is taking the more appropriate step versus wearing cotton gloves. Cotton gloves are not impermeable to um, toxic pesticides, and therefore, um, whereas nitrile gloves are. And so, you know, the wearer on the left is, is at risk, um, while the wearer at the right is not. Also, looking at your collections can sometimes be um, 
a very interesting, can provide an interesting set of clues. If you have collections that have um, that have very similar, very similar feathered decoration and are similar formats, and you see that one is beautifully uh, preserved, the feathers are beautifully preserved, and the other example is the absolute opposite. Um, I would say that um, you should, uh, you can, you can handle the one on the right without nearly the caution that you might take with the with the item on the left. So better preservation, more chance that it's been treated right with pesticides. So I also have a poll um, poll question poll number four, which is asking whether featherwork in your collections have been treated with toxic pesticides if you know and I'd be very interested to know your answers. So I'm I'm sort of crazy about documentation of feathers. Um, and I, I feel like there's a standard that we perhaps should all use or aspire to use. And I think it's because feathers represent a lot of cultural decision making and that that is really important to document just as other materials are important to document. So this is a, a, an image of a curator from the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., Candace Green. And Candace is making the um, evaluation that the tribal use of certain feathers reflects not only the cultural choices, but also which birds were dominant in a given area. So the, the, there's been a huge project at the National Museum of Natural History, and I have the link on the screen here, to, um, to better understand the particular, these particular collections through identification of the bird of the bird species whose feathers are represented and that's actually represented in my um, my poll number three which is to find out from all of you what percent of the birds in your collections have been identified uh, in terms of the feather in terms of feather work in addition to documenting the bird source um, and there are tools to allow us to better do this as collections care specialists. I also think it's really important to document the ways in which feathers have been attached and adapted and modified. And this, the image that you're seeing here was prepared by Molly Gleason, who is a UCLA Getty alumni and was a research associate as well. Um, and you can see that there are all these different ways that feathers are typically attached to other media when they're prepared. So folding and wrapping um, and inserting is very, very common. Um, wrapping, just wrapping, simple wrapping, as you see in the center, two right-hand images is another very common attachment method. Um, tying on, so literally encircling a group of feathers and knotting it um, on the other side to tie things. Um, adhering is used, sewing is used, especially when the skin is still on the featherwork, um, sewing to another, another material. And then um, feather wrapping, which you see in the um, lower right, is actually almost like feathers can be spun the same way, especially um, plumaceous but downy feathers can be spun the same way that yarns are, and they can then be used as an element for wrapping and, um, and weaving. Then we're, we're going to also look at feather modification techniques. Again, um, there are all these modification techniques, so when you're looking at feathers, um, you, you may not see them the way they actually appear on the bird. They may actually have been trimmed. So the arrow is pointing to feathers. There are a group of different feathers. This is also deerskin. The center section is deerskin. But, um, but some feathers are trimmed to look pointier than they actually are on the body of the bird. And it's really interesting culturally to know that this happens. This is a beautiful technique of serration where feathers are trimmed to have this kind of serrated edge. And I knew of this only from um, central and northern California and some 
some other areas in the American Southwest. And now I've found that it's actually used on certain Pacific Islands and um, showing up on Pacific Islander featherwork. So again, these are really, really interesting kinds of cultural adaptations that are being applied to featherwork. Um, here's an example of where the feather has been split. So here's another point. Um, feathers are really valuable. People who collect and work with feathers consider them to be rare and precious. In more recent times, they're also considered endangered or um, protected, and um, uh, Irene is going to talk about that. But um, people try to um, actually make their feathers go farther. So the idea of splitting uh, the central shaft of a feather and actually getting two ornaments out of it is um, has a lot of um, there's a lot of good cultural social reasons behind that. These are stripped feathers. So this is again the central California, and I have a very strong interest in California feather work. So these are where the where the um, the barbs or the the colorful regions on the side of each shaft of a feather have been stripped off except for at the tips and this is a you know distinct choice that's being made to create a certain kind of headdress and it was the the headdress that I showed you in the second slide in the center showing cultural use so this is a very um, something that we see a lot in California. And then finally, the, the final modification technique that I'll just show you right now in this conversation is where the, the shaft is cut. So the central heavy section of the feather, which is that shaft, has actually been cut in this fancy format um, in a form of notching. And this also is Californian regalia. And it makes the feathers curl. And it makes them lighter in weight so that if you're performing the feather work, if it's a headdress or a dance plume, it actually is lighter in weight and um, you know, can, can actually um, ha have more movement. It has more movement. So, so these, I think, are all really important to record as you look at feathers in your collection. Also, by the way, I should just say, I see that people are posting about working with ornithologists. And I think that working with ornithologists is a, is a really exceptionally good um, way to proceed if you have access to um, uh, an ornithologist who can help you identify feathers. That is really great, really, really great. So now I want to talk about the kinds of damage. We just talked about documenting feather work. Um, and understanding a little bit more about its origin and background. And now I want to talk about four major classes of damage that occur to feathers, and in some instances, steps that you can take or steps that are taken by conservators. So we're looking at dirt, insect damage, um, breakage or mechanical damage, um, and damage from light and ultraviolet energy. We'll talk about each of these in turn now. So we're talking first about dirt, and I want to bring your attention to the image in the lower left, because I've been talking about that central shaft um, uh, quite a bit, and also about downy feathers. Um, but this is uh, just a diagram to show you what some of the technical terms are. So that central shaft in a feather is referred to as a rachis, R-A-C-H-I-S. And the, the lowest portion of the feather that gets inserted into the body of the bird, into this passes through the bird's skin, is known as the calamus. And only the calamus is hollow. And so if you think about the slide I showed you where the feather is turned over, folded over at that base and inserted back into that hollow section, you can see that people are taking advantage of the fact that that calamus is hollow. Um, also, the two sides that project off of that central shaft or rachis are referred to as the vein, and they're made up of barbs. So each of those individual elements are barbs. Um, and those barbs are hooked together with tiny, tiny little hooks 
that are known as barbules. And we, there are typically two different kinds of feathers, or more than two, but for our discussion, there are these smooth feathers that are known as panaceous. So the image of the drawing on the left would be a smooth panaceous feather. And then at the base of both of these feathers, there is this downy feather, which is referred to as plumulaceous. And the image on the upper left, which is a detail of a Zuni katsina, is also showing you plumulaceous, the white feathers. The soiled white feathers are plumulaceous or downy feathers and the orange feather below them is a smooth, um, tenacious feather. But it brings me, again, back to this question of dirt. I'm defining this so that I can really talk through this notion of dirt. So cleaning, addressing dirt, depends on the use, the type, and the purpose for the item. So the first question I have, because there's so much indigenous feather work, the first question I have is, is the featherwork still in use? Is it still being worn or danced? Is it in the possession of the person who made it? And will that influence the way in which cleaning takes place? And I can tell you that the answer is most decidedly yes. I've had a lot of conversations with feather, feather workers who tell me their own care practices. But it, let's say it's in your collection and you are um, you are kind of now tasked with its care. Um, so my questions would then be, are the feathers strong and stable? And my next question would be, are the feathers the smooth, tenacious kind, or are they the downy or plumulaceous kind? The downy feathers are much more difficult to clean. As soon as they are disrupted, they tend to lose a lot of material. Um, they, um, they're, they're trickier to clean carefully. Um, and so there, there are all of these considerations. So I'll be showing you some examples of cleaning of smooth feathers, um, and then perhaps I can take questions about, about the more um, downy feathers. But my next question is, can you access the feathers individually? Because oftentimes, as we know, feathers almost never alone from other items. They're always attached to something made out of a completely different material. And often we can only access one part or a few parts of the featherwork. And we can't, so our goals have to be in keeping with what we can actually access when we set out to clean feathers. And then my final question is, might there be pigment or material traces on the feathers that warrant preservation? And have you looked closely enough to actually determine whether there's something present that could be really important that might get compromised when you carry out a cleaning? So all of that, I'm very interested in this careful looking and careful documentation of feathers um, for all of these reasons. So if you feel, if you've considered all of those questions, and you feel you are able to clean feather work that's in your collection, there are, I think, two really important steps that I would ask you to do. Number one is take photographs. Um, take photographs before beginning, even if they're the simplest point and shoot photographs. Take photographs of all the sides that you can access, and take photographs of details of what the soiling actually looks like. And then number two, Two is you have to figure out how you're going to safely support the feather work. And I think this image from the Metropolitan Museum of Art of fashion, which is all feathered, I mean, this is all feathered fashion. And I feel like, you know, the way, like if you can imagine in your mind's eye, how would you support these feathered garments? in preparation for cleaning, especially the one on the right, which, I mean, I don't know these items, but I'm just saying um, you can see how, why I'm stressing the idea of figuring out in advance how you're going to support the feather work. So if pesticides are suspected, and we've already said that if the feathers are robust and well, you know, in, in a reasonably good condition, pesticides are very highly likely 
you should be supporting your feather work on a disposable liner on your work surface. So I would say that you could use a liner of soft tissue or a liner of Tyvek. And on the handout that is provided, you, you'll find all of these. So every supply that's discussed in this webinar is, is um, outlined there with um, sources for purchase. But for example, if you have a three-dimensional object that is, has feathers appended onto it, like the item on the right, you can take it off of its mount, put your tissue or your Tyvek across the mount itself, have it extend out beyond the farthest point that the feathers reach out on, you know, beyond the base of the mount, place the headdress back, and carry out your cleaning with that protective interleaf so that you are able to safely dispose of whatever might be collecting um, materials that you are um, now dislodging. One of the things we know about toxic pesticide residues, a lot of them are heavy metals. They're particulate. They will stay in place and only be toxic if you directly contact them or if you displace them. If you displace them, vacuuming is a perfect way to displace toxic pesticides. Next, I would say that you would want to use flat sable brushes, and you would want to make sure that you are labeling those brushes as only for use with pesticide-suspected items. Um, you can clean the brushes with detergent and water in between and dry them, but I would still segregate them and restrict their use. Also, for cleaning um, pesticide-ridden pieces, um, a, a triple filtered vacuum cleaner known as a HEPA filtered vacuum is a very crucial component for their cleaning. There are, um, there are large, expensive vacuum cleaners that are, um, they're, again, they're listed on the handout. Um, those have variable speed, and they're great, and micro tools are available for them. Um, but there are also these less expensive, what I've imaged here is a less expensive HEPA vacuum that's made for com cleaning computer printers um, and protection from making um, copier toner airborne. And this is um, the idea of these, the HEPA vacuums, no matter whether you have a large, robust one or a smaller one, is that you are not wanting to exhaust into the environment what you're brushing. You want it to be caught by your filtration. And you, you can see I put an X next to the nylon uh, brush that comes with these kinds of um, HEPA vacuums. That is not something you'd want to use, but the micro tools are something you'd want to use. This is an example of one of the larger HEPA vacuums. And we always recommend that you have something covering the vacuum nozzle um, that some sort of mesh, whether it is pantyhose or cheesecloth, is held over the vacuum nozzle with a rubber band or um, a tie. And you want to do this because very often when you're examining featherwork, you cannot tell that there are loose barbs or there are loose feathers that are actually only being held by um, the mechanical action of the rest of the feathers. And so you want to be sure that you're not sucking any of those feathers up into your vacuum and totally losing them. So my recommendation for, for vacuuming or dry cleaning the, the feathers is, again, nitrile gloves and a dust mask or respirator to protect yourself. Your support is, you know, your, your, your worktop, your bench is lined with a disposable material. You, you are, to the extent possible, supporting separate feathers with blotter paper where possible. If you don't have blotter paper, you can use um, another kind of paper-based material to support the feather. Blotter paper has a certain kind of strength that creates a platform that you can hold on to. And then you always want to brush feathers um, parallel to the barbules. 
So what the diagram on the on the right, lower right, is showing you the brushing action that you want to take because you want to encourage your feathers to um, keep that alignment that they have when they're on the bird. Also very useful for dry cleaning feathers are microfiber cloths. These are now incredibly popular. They're nylon and polyester, and the, the percentages, don't worry about the percentages I have here. Um, if you can find, and I've put down on the handout some suppliers for suede, non-waffle, smooth microfiber cloths. These are exceptional at trapping dirt and dust. They can be, I encourage you to buy the white ones that come in white um, and the non-waffly ones so that they're very, very smooth. You can tie these onto the nozzle of your vacuum and you can place them in contact with the featherwork and run them over the featherwork and pick up soiling as you're cleaning. And you can also, um, if you if if there are pesticides present, and you and you suspect or know that, I would just dispose of the used microfiber cloth. By the way, I would recommend washing the cloth before you use it, so that any commercial preparation that's been added to it is removed. And again, try to purchase white, so we're not dealing with dye stuffs that have been added. And if you're, if you're vacuuming other kinds of materials that you don't think are pesticide treated, you can wash these and reuse them. But you can, you can also dispose of them where pesticides might be present. Another very useful item are cosmetic sponges. These are sold in most pharmacies. They're very, very smooth. We recommend the latex cosmetic sponges. They're, they're usually labeled as such. They can be trimmed and to small sizes. You can just cut them with a scissor or a blade. And again, I would clean in the direction of the feather bard, supporting the feather, and you can discard these when they're, when they're soiled. Also very, very useful. Getting, going farther than dry cleaning or dry dirt removal, is something that I think really should be brought to the attention of the conservator. And I say that because of the other things I talked about earlier, about um, you know, other things that can, you can, you know, moisture um, tangles up downy feathers and gets them, creates you know, a very, um, an appearance that is not at all like the original appearance that you would want to preserve. Um, also, you know, we, we're starting to see more materials that are dyed and painted feathers. And the reason we're seeing a lot of that is because more, more recent people who are working with feathers, contemporary feather workers, are actually unable to gain access to feathers that they want to gain access to due to their due to legal controls. And therefore, you can be dealing with the interaction of whatever you'd be using with dyes and, and pigments and paints. And so I think it's really important to work with a conservator so that the appropriate testing can take place. And here's a conservation intern, a conservator, at a natural history museum in England. And she is, again, she's supporting the feathers, and she's using water and ethanol in this particular case after doing testing um, to, to figure out safety. And here's another example. This is, uh, these are images from a conservator who um, does a lot of work on feather work. And her, um, her website is at the bottom of this slide. And she was cleaning the downy feathers, the plumulaceous feathers on this war bonnet. And she was using um, sol a solvent system and using these cosmetic pads. And so you can see that, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, look at this feathered, look at this feather war bonnet. The downy feathers are absolutely attracting dirt preferentially to the eagle feathers behind them. So we are, you know, we are pressed to kind of, um, she, you know, she, in order to return this to a display worthy 
um, condition, this kind of treatment is definitely warranted, but again, most responsibly done by a conservator. Next, I wanted to talk a bit about insect damage. Um, and I'm showing you images here of the two likeliest culprits, at least in the United States. Um, I'm showing you a webbing clothes moth on the top right, and I'm showing you a varied carpet beetle on the lower right. And what I can say is that the carpet beetles, actually, there are a lot of variations of carpet beetles. And we in the US are seeing a lot of varied carpet beetle. But um, the, uh, in other parts of the world, other kinds of carpet beetles are also turning up as predators for feathers. And I wanted to point out to you that what, feather dam what insect damage often looks like on feathers is a major loss area in a whole group of barbs. So I'm hoping you can see that on the large image here, that you've got parallel losses, gapped losses, um, that toward the tip on the right side of the screen and the grayer part of that feather, you're see seeing these narrow kind of losses. Um, and then moving toward the middle of the slide, the, where the transition from gray to white, you're seeing larger losses. And that's a lot of what insect damage tends to look like. But I'm also going to show you examples of other kinds of insect damage that you can identify. So first, I wanted to also point out to you that it's not only feathers that are subject to insect damage. There are many materials that are close relatives of feathers, like quill work, um, wool, silk, hair, fur, et cetera, et cetera, everything else listed. And these two could show um, this kind of damage, telltale damage from insects. So this is another great slide produced by Molly Gleason. And these are showing examples of different forms of insect damage on feathers. So on the, on the top left and in the center and on the far right, you see exactly what I referenced earlier. You see this kind of. Um, loss of section, whole sections of the feather. Um, on the left, top left, you see also what we refer to as grazing, which is where you have a, a superficial kind of beginning, but it looks like um, a sort of a movement. Um, of, you can imagine the movement of the insect larva across the feather as it was. Um, it's, so it's quite directional. And so you see that kind of shallow, what we call grazing. On the lower left, you see particulate. That is um, the sort of a, it's frass. It's a, it's a product called frass, which is um, part of the insect's digestive process. And they leave um, evidence of their digestion um, on, the, on the item. And in the center, lower center, you see where the insects have preferentially gone to the shaft. They've kind of ignored the vein on either side, and they've preferentially gone into that shaft, dug in, and undermined the, um, that, that shaft area. So just, so just to give you some ideas of what to be looking for. So when active pests are suspected, the first thing I would recommend that you do is enclose the featherwork in two, two bags. You know, first one, seal it, then a second, and seal it. And polyethylene bags are the best. Um, they're very stable. And put the date on the exterior of the outer bag. Um, continue checking if you're not sure whether or not you're looking at old insect activity that's not currently ongoing. Continue to check that item and look for changes, look for changes, because active insects are going to be producing more frass. Um, they're going to be producing, you're going to see more debris associated with, or more losses associated with the larva. And um, to be, to be um, moved to another step, anybody who identifies um, active insect pests 
should be thinking about the implementation of an integrated pest management program. We don't have time to talk about that right now. So um, there are links on the handout which will tell you about resources for integrated pest management. Also, if you currently have active pests, you should be considering non-chemical steps like freezing or anoxia treatment. Um, both of these have been found to be extremely successful against webbing closed moths and in particular against carpet beetles. And again, there are links to describe that process to you um, since we don't have the time to do that right now. So moving on to breakage or mechanical damage, um, there are methods available to conservators for the repair and reconstruction of broken feathers. And again, um, the, the way in which we make these decisions often depends on the cultural sensitivity and also the presentation goals. So, um, you know, I know regalia makers who are taking care of their own feathers, and they do things like trim off damaged feathers. In the museum environment, that would be a totally inappropriate thing to do. Also, the idea of replacing feathers that have become damaged is something that um, we, in the case of in a museum environment, it, it, with certain indigenous materials, you cannot replace feathers with feathers from another bird. Um, so, and you cannot access the original feathers because they're endangered. So these are complex questions associated with feather replacement. But typically, conservators try to relax feather damage by using warm water introduced either through compresses or as a mist, and then apply splinting devices with adhesives to either either side of the damage or running along the damage itself. And so that's also something that is, um, would I think, be done best in consultation with a conservator. Damage from light and ultraviolet energy is definitely something that you can take charge about as a, any kind of caretaker, any kind of steward. Um, protection from excess light and ultraviolet energy is important for feathered collections, no matter what their origin is. Um, if you are now storing or displaying feather work opposite a light source, a window, or a door that's glazed, you should really think about that positioning of feather work. If you have windows in storage, you should think about blocking off those windows. Um, if, you're, if you have unfiltered fluorescent light, you should think about filtering those light sources. Um, the, interestingly, so this is the two, the center and right-hand image are from the Pitt Rivers Museum in um, uh, England, in Oxford, England. And they have this beautiful Hawaiian cloak feathered cloak, completely feathered, and it's on permanent exhibition. And what they decided to do was to have a velvet curtain in front of the cloak so that when somebody wants to view the cloak, the, the audience member has to press a button. It opens up the velvet curtain, and the lights go on in the case. So there are all kinds of creative ways to limit light. Um, just to tell you, the image on the left that I'm showing you is a scarlet ibis feather that was part of a study that I conducted with colleagues. We masked off the center section, the red section of that feather, and we exposed the top and the bottom, well, the whole thing, but with the center masked off, we exposed it to a lot of light and some UV, and you can see the incredible color loss that occurred. So I hope that that um, impresses you with how important it is um, to protect feathers from light and ultraviolet, particularly ultraviolet. And I want to just end with a few great slides of how to store feather work safely, because I, really, I feel like if you can protect your feather work from light and UV, and you can store it well, 
you've you've gone. You've, that's more than half the battle. Um, you, you know, acid-free materials are really important. The same Tyvek we talked about before, Epifoam and Valara, which are polyethylene foams. Again, sources are on the handout. And then I just decided I would show you some examples of wonderful storage for feathered collections of various um, sources, predominantly indigenous. But so on the left, you see a California feathered blanket in the National Museum of Natural History. It's stored flat, unfolded, um, flat and face up, feathers face up, on a piece of Tyvek and on, on epiphone on a metal shelf. On the right are feathered items that were repatriated to the Yurok Nation. And they are all on either acid-free board pallets, or the lowest one is a tray. And they're just simply flat and face up. Um, the detail on the, on the top right, I believe, shows up in this slide. Again, it's a different, different item. But what you see here is that foam bumpers have been used to raise up the item in the areas that are not feathered so that nothing is putting pressure on the feather work. And that's a really great, this is a very simple solution for protecting these feathered items. These are dance wands. This is an example from the Field Museum. And this is an example where space would have been too great if these were unrolled and stored flat. These are macaw feathers, so instead they are um, they're put onto these trays, and there is a, a acid-free hollow tube that's been wrapped in Tyvek, and and the headdress has been wrapped around that format um, with enough room in the tray for the trailing part of the feather work. These are Hawaiian um, kahili um, from from the bishop in the left from the Bishop Museum. In Honolulu, these are royal regalia from Hawaii. These are enormous. I mean, you can see the size of these feathered stands. They're staffs that are carried. Um, and they're displayed with these elaborate carved stands. And at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, those um, stands for the staff part, the non-feathered part, are replicated using foam. And you can see sort of a detail on the right and the foam is starting below at the bottom of the image. But they're also sometimes the feathered parts are just wrapped in clear mylar, like a, a tube is made out of heavyweight clear mylar, polyester film, to protect the, the feathers from soiling. And then it, for things that are worn on the head, um, whether or not they're indigenous headdress, regalia, or fashion, um, it's best to store them in a format that is just like the way they would have been worn. So to create on the left is a um, archival um, tray with epiphone in it with a sculpted form that fits underneath the feathered headdress. The center image is um, I borrowed from Irene, our next speaker, and it's a mannequin head. It's probably not used for storage, but you can get the idea of what good support it's providing. And on the right are non-feathered items that are showing you what the interior of what a very um, creative kind of uh, support could look like for headdress items. In closing, I'm moving toward just showing you a, a, a final example. I believe this is my final example. And this is showing you. You know, this is a piece in the National Museum of the American Indian. All of these feathers are dyed. I was talking about how we're increasingly seeing dyed, you know, dyed feather work, right? And again, in this case, just the headdress part is supported internally, and the rest of the trailing part of the feather work is supported in this tray. So again, I just want to thank those whose images I've borrowed. Um, if you want to look at this, you, you most certainly can um, further on. And I want to thank you and just tell you, do a little shout out for the book that I published together with my students um, last year. And um, it has you know, many important points that are uh, applicable to Featherwork at large. OK, thank you.
I'm gonna, with that, I'm going to close and turn it over to Irene. Um, well, hi. Uh, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, I'm going to be a little uh, briefer about my section. Um, my, my experience with feathers is somewhat limited to um, my collection that uh, uh, and an exhibition that we once had about feathers, um, well, about uh, about hats, actually. And that's how I came across feathers. And let's see, how am I doing this? There we go, OK. Um, so I'm, I'm from an art museum, and uh, feathers found in my collection come in all different forms. Um, but uh, it can be a, a pink fuzzy jacket or, or an assemblage or a fan or, or a hat. Um, and uh, for the hat exhibition that we did uh, many years ago, we had to go to our local natural history museum. We, I believe our curator and conservator went uh, asked them to come over and got them some lunch and showed them our collection and and asked for what kind of feathers everything was because that was that was sort of needed for our catalog as well as when
other
object that We did have to learn about CITES, um, which is um, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. And even if your feathers are not endangered, you still have to document them if you're going to do any kind of uh, transportation internationally. Um, and in the United States, the CITES certificates um, are sort of a little harder than other countries, I believe. Uh, they're, uh, they're through the Fish and Wildlife and who are probably more interested in catching poachers than, than museum collections, so they don't actually always pay that much attention to our CITES. Um, I know I had some troubles in the exhibition bringing things in, getting inspectors to take a look. Um, we, we never really want inspectors to open up our crates, but I think one of our crates did have to get opened up for uh, hats that came from England. Um, and the feathers were basically chicken feathers, but um, it took us a while to figure out that. Um, again, CITES is based on endangered species, and it's a, a long act, and they're there are some exempt exemptions, antique exemptions, and pre-act exemptions, anything before 1973, if you can um, document that it uh, was acquired before that and knew the provenance, then that would help. Um, I would also suggest that you get in touch with an agent to do CITES if you're going to do them because um, I don't think I've ever actually done one myself. I always used uh, a shipping agent. Um, and they, they need to get documentation from us, documentation reproducing proof of the genus species. Again, if you're not a natural history museum, make friends with your natural history museum so you can identify your feathers. Um, interestingly, during uh, my looking through my hats exhibition I, or through my collection, I did come across this um, hat that's decorated with a whole bird of paradise, which evidently is now um, outlawed to import. So we're not going to be transporting that anytime soon. Uh, another agency to worry about if it's in your collection is migratory birds. I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, here's a link to um, find out what the laws are on migratory birds. Uh, again, Fish and Wildlife is your main, uh, your main agency for importing and exporting uh, feathers. Uh, uh, like I said, my experience with them is that they're not all that um, cooperative and make it, if you are doing an exhibition that's coming in and has to go out again, um, once you get something in with a CITES certificate, you need to start working on the export right away because it takes them a minimum of three months to uh, get the export. I've never quite understood that, but there you go. Um, and that's why th there, are, there are certain ports in the United States that you can bring CITES works in. Not all ports uh, are available for CITES. Like I am in Philadelphia, yet uh, I can only import into New York or Washington. Philadelphia is not a CITES port. Um, so 
I didn't have that much to say about it, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, most of the images were from my museum. Um, the hat show was a lot of fun, but it did have a lot of headaches with, with uh, fish and wildlife. And so it is something you need to consider if you're going to be transporting anything uh, in or out of the United States. And uh, thank you. OK. Um, I'm going to read out the questions. I'm also going to put up the evaluation link. Um, the evaluation links are really important. So um, please fill out an evaluation. They help us to determine our schedules for next year and what we're going to offer and stuff like that. So thanks. Um, and thank you both. Uh, OK. so. Cindy Opitz, I hope I said that correctly, said, what solvent was used to clean the downy feathers on that war bonnet? That's for Ellen. OK. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, because I yes. can't. I, sorry, I, was, I had muted my phone. OK, good. Um, so I know in that case um, that um, isopropanol was used. Uh, and you know, as I've mentioned, um, isopropanol is is you know available as kind of rubbing alcohol in the pharmacy. And um, but but there were also elaborate steps taken after the after the feathers had been wet up with that solvent to um, make sure that they were then either manipulated with gloved hands or there are other ways in which this, what happens when we wet down downy feathers, plumulaceous feathers, is that they end up, they look like scrawny, and they totally lose their, their loft. You know, they totally lose their fullness. And so there's usually multiple steps that are taken in the case of using any kind of solvent um, to recover the sort of fluffiness afterwards. So I just wanted to, you know, definitely make that point um, in answering that question. And also the, you know, the alcohol will, um, you know, if if there's if there's any sort of, I mean, we typically we certainly do see dyed um, dyed downy feathers. Um, we, we very rarely see them painted, but we certainly see them dyed. And um, if, if it, in any case you're looking at dyed feathers, um, there's no guarantee that the alcohol won't take it right off. So. OK. Um, Dee Studsley said, um, are some types of feathers more susceptible to insect, uh, insect attack? Or is it more due to housekeeping and environmental issues? For Ellen, too. I okay. Guess. This, yeah, this is Ellen. So um, I can say that, that a really interesting um, bit of research that um, we, we conducted, uh, a group of us conducted, was actually um, looking at the protective quality of the pigmentation that occurs on feathers. And it it actually is not so much the feather itself, the you know the protein that's making up the feather itself, but the but the different coloration, natural colorations of feathers. Um, some are more protective than others against insect damage. So melanin, which is what creates the black brown um, gray coloration that we see in feathers, is actually a relatively more protective than some other colorants. You know, so if you had an item that was that had an undyed feathers and it included some brown feathers, but it also included some bright red feathers, you might actually see that the brown feathers are um, more resistant to um, insect damage than are the, the red and yellow feathers. So um, Dee added, she wonders if this applies also to furs. 
No. Um, well, furs don't have the same range of coloration that feathers do. Um, furs are pretty much, um, I, you know, I wasn't going to, I mean, that's fine. I love talking about this, but, um, you know, feathers, feathers have such a gamut of potential colorants that are used to produce the color. Um, and furs, it's much more restricted. You know, furs, it's pretty much melanin and porphyrin, you know, whereas feathers, there's like five other different things, you know, that could be used. And so it's, um, it's, it's less applicable directly to fur. But one of the things I think is really interesting is like, for example, I've seen this and I bet others have too, that when you have dyed examples of like quill work, because we, you know, a lot of our collections include porcupine quill decoration on, you know, all kinds of supports, um, birch, birch bark boxes, let's say, you know, and, and you can see that, or quill decoration on garments, leather garments, and you can see that insects have selectively nibbled on the ones that are dyed with certain dyes, and they've avoided the quills that are dyed with other dyes. So I think there is more work to be done. I think that would be, that's really, it's a great question and something, it's more, it's work that needs to be done. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kathleen Christensen said, what are, uh, what type of splints are used to repair broken shaft uh, on, broken shafts on feathers? So um, in, um, in the sort of overview that I've seen, I mean, so many different kinds of things have been used. And it, they've been used because it depends on the weight of the feather, right? There's everything from these huge eagle feathers and turkey feathers, which are, you know, fl um, wing and tail feathers that are really big, you know, from big birds to tiny little feathers, you know, chest feathers from a, a duck, you know, which are, you know, fluffy little tiny feathers. So it, so keep that in mind, you know, so when we're talking about splints, we're talking about things, materials that are chosen to be appropriate to the size and the str needed strength of that feather. And it can be anything from cotton thread to Japanese tissue twists, to pulled out strands of conservation grade adhesive, to actually um, taking a comparable size shaft from another bird and carving out uh, a hollow section of a, a, a shaft of another bird and applying that on. So it's it's um it's a really varied kind of um, program of decision making um, that happens in considering uh, what kind of splint to use. Okay, I'm adding a question of mine, and that is, um, you suggested anoxia and uh, freezing for treating pests, but what about heat treatments for pests? I know we use them a lot in the West for moths because yeah. you can wrap things, put, put them in the heat for a couple of hours and it kills everything, um, but it's not you enough know, to damage. Go ahead. Not, it's not, and it's not enough to damage the, the, the materials themselves, the cultural materials. Yeah. I, you know, I think actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up actually, Susan. I think, you know, I think heat treatment is, um, is a great option, and um, I know that um, you know. I know that there's there's great guidelines for heat treatment written by Thomas Strang in Canada. Um, you know, he's done a lot of exploration of that of that technique. Um, I I'm not sure that there is a easy to access. Um, guide, but maybe, you know, Susan, if you know of one, like a conservogram, you know, from the National Park Service, or... There's one from uh, WAC. Know, 
Is there one from WAC? On yeah, YouTube? I'll add it. I'll add it Wait. to the handout before I post it. That's okay. Great. Yeah. Um, Mary Scholler says, from time to time, I do come in contact with arrows with, feather, with feathers, and I appreciate the image for recommended storage. And then um, D. Stubbs Lee said, Mary, we have feathers that are tipped with uh, curare um, poisoning. Another mm -hmm. thing to keep in mind, <laughs> depending on the origin. Yep. Thank you, yep. Dee. 